Hey, hello everyone. Um, welcome back. Um, so if you're here at the beginning, then um, yeah, welcome back. And if you're just joining for this talk, um, welcome. I'm Amelia. I'm the president of Oxford Physics Society. Um, and I'm very excited to welcome Dr. Palladino as our second talk of the um, Joint Physics Societies Conference. Um, so we'll start in a few minutes, um, just in case anybody is still rejoining. Um, Does this slide look cut off right now to you? Yep, me too. Okay, let me keep fixing. Is that full screen now? Yep, excellent, okay. Okay, if everyone is ready, um, then welcome to the second session of the um, joint conference on um, Beyond the Standard Model. Um, Dr. Kimberly Palladino from Oxford will be speaking about um, dark matter. Um, we're very excited for her talk and you'll be able to ask questions in the chat during the talk. Um, and then as well, there will be a Q&A session um, after her slides. Excellent. Thank you guys for having me. And I was able to see the last speaker and it was a wonderful talk too. So I, I hope I can live up to that. So I'll be giving you an overview of the state of dark matter searches right now, specifically what we call direct dark matter searches. And this is a picture of our photomultiplier tube array for the LZ experiment. And um, as you can tell, I'm an American, but it also turns out that the collaboration years ago decided that they would stick with the, the American pronunciation. So even, even all the Brits have to say LZ instead of LZ. Um, and it's, it's always feels so funny that in our search for dark matter, we really need to have um, the most cutting edge light sensors um, possible. And you'll see why um, as I go through my talk. So as we heard before, it's really astrophysics that gives us our evidence for dark matter. And these, this first evidence started coming from these uh, rotation curves from um, Fritz Zwicky studying the, the coma cluster of galaxies, and then really in looking at individual stars in galaxies. And so in the top left is the M33 rotation curve where you can see what the visual extent of the galaxy is shown in the photograph. And then you can see that there are stars that you can trace out further. And if you just expected most of the mass of the galaxy to be in the luminous disk, you would expect the velocity of the stars you would measure out to higher radii to follow the, the orange curve. And that's, for instance, what we see in our own solar system where most of the mass is in the sun. But um, what was observed instead was the green data points 
And, and this is really a mystery and it was really set in the 1960s by, by Vera Rubin and collaborators. But at this point, we, there just needed to be dark matter that was just literally dark, not glowing, not something that we could see with a telescope. And that didn't need a major change in any um, physical sense. This is some of the, the nicest evidence to show, you know, you can, you can explain it to your parents, but it is also some of the weakest in that it's one of the places where modified theories of gravity do the best. It's in some other areas um, of evidence where the idea of really a particle for dark matter um, shines brightly. So on the top right, we see um, an image of the bullet cluster where there's false coloring showing where red is where hot gas glows um, in radio emission as our two clusters of galaxies have collided and, and gone past each other. But when we use gravitational lensing, we trace out the matter in the blue blobs. And that means that even though these two clusters of galaxies passed through each other and all the dust included in them got hot and stayed in the middle and interacted, the dark matter just kept going. So it not only didn't interact with the dust and the other stars, but it didn't interact with the other dark matter. And that's kind of a very striking image um, to see. Some of the, the next data that here is less quantitative, but quite visual is down on the lower right and two of these four quadrants are, um, are maps of our, of our universe, and the other two are simulations. And unless you look closely and see that the, the blue and purple are the data and the, the red and orange are the simulations, they, they look very similar. Strikingly, for these simulations, only a universe of dark matter particles is simulated. If instead you simulate a universe of regular matter only, none of this structure evolves in this way. And it's only when you start getting basically to galaxy sizes and smaller that to understand the structures we see, you have to include regular matter. So on big, big scales, as things um, get are shaped by gravity, most of the mass of our universe is in the dark matter. And, and the regular matter mass traces that dark matter mass um, in general. So these big nodes are where um, galaxies are making light. Our best quantitative information about how much dark matter there has to be comes from the cosmic microwave background. But here it comes from an eight parameter fit to, um, to the power spectrum from the cosmic microwave background, specifically in where the second and third peaks are and their relative heights related to the first peak. So in all of those fits, we find out that our universe um, is really dominated by dark energy. After that comes dark matter. And then with about only 5% um, of everything else in our known universe is the stuff we spend our time studying and understanding. And when you become a dark matter physicist, you take a solemn oath that you will always show a pie chart um, in one of your talks. So I have fulfilled my duties. So what could this dark matter be? So all this evidence is coming from, from these, these uh, astronomers and cosmologists, and then it gets to the particle physics theorists to come up with, with what it could possibly be. And we've got now 90s orders of magnitude of the mass of the particle of what these different options for dark matter are. And they've got a lot of different names. Some of them um, are confusing. Some of them are quite broad. And I'm gonna spend most of my time talking about one of the longest living um, particle candidates, which is the WIMP, the weakly interacting massive particle. Now, we'll see on the next slide, this original idea was for it to actually be um, a particle that interacts with the weak force, um, exchanging W and Z bosons like normal matter does. And in fact, really viewing it like a heavier version of the neutrino. That's less clear nowadays is the model, but, but the rest of the physics story um, has stayed together. Now, again, if you wanna poke fun at all of the different um, options theorists can come up with, um, XKCD has beat you to it. And you know, uh, some of my favorite options are bees and space cows, of course. So if we're gonna look for these weakly interacting um, massive particles, we have different ways to think about how particles um, can interact. And here's a very abstracted Feynman diagram of how interactions can happen. And that's one of the wonderful things about being a dark matter physicist. We don't know how it's working. There's a big question mark in the middle and we can be quite hand wavy as we discuss our options. 
So if we're reading this um, from, from top to bottom, we're looking for our X or chi dark matter particle, the unknown to annihilate and create standard model particles. And so if we essentially, if we can see high energy standard model particles coming from places where we can't explain it from standard astrophysical processes, that could be a signature of dark matter. And so that's indirect detection from annihilation. If we instead read this um, from the bottom up, we've got standard model particles annihilating and cre potentially creating dark matter. And this would be production like at a collider. And essentially your, your dark matter particle um, could be carried away and you'd have missing energy. In fact, the type of searches that they do at colliders for dark matter are, are much more sophisticated than just looking for missing energy. And in fact, they are probing what is in that question mark because that's what's fundamentally produced after our standard model interaction. So finally, what I'm gonna spend most of the rest of the time talking about today is the direct scattering approach where we've got a dark matter particle uh, scattering off of a standard model particle. And what we detect is the standard model particle that recoils away. And the only explanation we can have for it recoiling away would be dark matter because we've controlled all of the standard model processes in the way. So between all of these, we can have some joke names for them. So we've got the, the shake it, break it, make it option. We also have to you know, give credit to the theorists who are giving these options to go after, and they bake up the ideas. And as I've said, I'm gonna really be focusing on this direct um, scattering option of where we're shaking things up. So what is a weakly interacting massive particle? Well, originally people liked this idea because of the idea of a WIMP miracle. And this idea is if you follow this plot um, where we've got it's time um, or the mass of the particle or really the temperature of our universe on the X um, axis and just a relative abundance on the Y axis. When we've got our, our hot early universe, we're creating particles, they're annihilating, they're becoming other particles. And as the universe expands and cools, we stop having enough energy to create more of a massive particle. And so our abundance drops and it keeps dropping until we've cooled and expanded so far that the particles can't find each other to annihilate. And we freeze in a constant um, relic density. And so if we took a mass of around 100 GeV, which is on our weak scale, and we had it interact with cross sections again on the weak scale, then the naive um, density becomes a third of a GeV per cubic centimeter. So a third of a proton um, per cubic centimeter, is the, our universe's density of dark matter. And that's indeed what has generally been measured. And so this, you know, locked together perfectly and is called the WIMP miracle. These ideas then also fit quite naturally with supersymmetry that the lightest um, supersymmetric partner, the neutralino would be your dark matter candidate particle. So this is what, you know, by the 1980s really had people looking for WIMP dark matter. Now we no longer um, are requiring it to be perfectly hundred, you know, even on the order of hundred GeV, we're looking at masses, orders of magnitude um, in, in either direction. I'm still calling it a WIMP. We're not really looking for it to interact um, with the W or Z boson. In fact, um, our best options for it to, to still be tightly linked with other physics we know right now is would be a Higgs mediated um, interaction. And it, it really then, it doesn't really have to be super symmetric either. So it's just kind of a paradigm in our head that, that lets us go after this idea of, of dark matter bouncing off of regular matter. Um, but, but none of these ideas actually have to be the case. And, and in physics speak, that means we're model independent. So if you're gonna build a direct detector, what do you need? Well, you have to be able to see these low energy WIMP induced recoils, which means you want a really radiogenically pure detector. So there's not a lot of events going on in your background. You want it to have a low threshold. And here I've only written tens of KeV, but in fact, now we're down um, much lower than that in energy. You want the ability to distinguish a nuclear recoil, which most of our dark battle models tell us to expect. 
um, to tell the difference between electronic recoils, which is where most of our backgrounds are, because electrons and gamma rays um, and even alpha particles um, are going to naturally interact with an electron because of their charges rather than a nucleus. Um, and again, seeing those alphas from um, radioactive decays from things like uranium and thorium that are just in all of our detectors um, versus a heavier nucleus um, of our detector material recoiling. Want to be different. We want to be able to know where in our detector an interaction happened because most of our backgrounds come from the outside, either outside of our detector or edge materials of our detector. We're studying the very inside of our detector. And for this, we use a very specific word, fiducialization, where we have a fiducial volume, an inner volume that is going to be a reference volume to always use for our searches. And fitting into all of these is that we still need some shielding from both the radiogenic backgrounds, so radioactive decays, and cosmogenic backgrounds, so particles coming at us from space. And so we build large shields around our detectors, and we generally put them deep underground um, to shield them. So there's a long history of detectors and what they all have in common is that they look beautiful and photograph really well. Um, there are a lot of cryogenic crystals. There are gas detectors. There are liquid detectors. Um, there are superheated detectors. There are super cooled detectors. There's many different ways about going after a really low threshold um, uh, event. And if we focus at just one mass, about a 60 GeV, where a number of detectors um, are really optimized, you can see that in the last 20 years and projecting out another 10 years, we've really made you know, orders of magnitude improvements in our sensitivity looking um, for these dark matter detectors. The earliest experiments were, were crystals, germanium and sodium iodide, um, as well as some uh, other crystals, including sapphire. And then we see that the liquid xenon and liquid argon experiments um, in purple and in red have really taken over and, and really sped up where our sensitivity is um, in time, where these open um, holes are showing where uh, future experiments hope their sensitivities um, to fall following where we are right now. So this is um, a key plot dark matter physicists like to show about how, how good we've gotten at our job. Um, but even though we continue to set those limits, there have been hints of signals in the past, not all of which are entirely resolved, um, even though what we do in our field is sweep these kind of under the rug. So the most important of all of these is the still outstanding um, Dama Libra result. Now this is an experiment that can't tell the difference between its electronic recoils and its nuclear recoils. So their technique um, is looking for something called annual modulation, where the idea is there's a, a dark matter wind that fills our, our, our galaxy. And as the earth goes around the sun, our motion with respect to those dark matter particles change. And so when we're going in one direction, we're going into the dark matter wind. And so that could bring interactions, some scatters just above threshold. And so you'd get a higher rate of events than when you're going with the wind. And you can think about this, and this is why there's you know dead bugs on the front of your car, um, but not on the back of your car when you're driving down um, an expressway. And so this annual modulation has been seen. They've got more than a 13 sigma excess. Many, many people have tried to explain it with an annually modulating background, um, but none have worked yet. And and so this is um, really a key project um, of understanding why other experiments that are now um, almost five orders of magnitude more sensitive than Dama Libra have not seen this signal either in the backgrounds um, or in the signal. And because it uses these sodium iodide crystals, what the community has done is built new experiments that are coming online um, out of sodium iodide crystals. The other signals have also been in crystal experiments. Um, in CREST-2, it's an experiment that used, um, used calcium tungstenate. And in this plot, um, it, you're going to see a whole bunch similar to this. You've got some proxy for energy on the x-axis, and on the y-axis, some proxy for your telling if you've got a, a nuclear recoil um, or an electronic recoil. So all of our electronic recoils and gamma ray lines are up in the black fuzz at the top of this plot. And since we have calcium tungstenate, there's, four di there's three different 
um, nuclei that could be recoiling. We've got three different bands for where the events could be. And what was expected in a dark matter search is that we're expecting a coherent interaction with the whole nucleus. And that means that your rate of events would go as your number of nucleons squared. And so you want a big heavy nucleus that's gonna get bumped into. And so the expectation was that if you saw a signal, it would be um, in the tungsten area. But instead what Crest saw were interactions that looked like they were happening with the lightest of their nuclei with their oxygen. And that would match up with a very light dark matter particle in kind of the five to 10 GeV, not in the 60 to 100 GeV region where it interacting with the tungsten doesn't get the event over threshold to be seen, but bouncing into the lighter oxygen nucleus does. So those are those uh, red events in the orange band. These might be explained by surface effects on the crystal. Um, and that's generally accepted by the field, although not necessarily by the collaboration itself. Then we've got the CDMS collaboration um, in their silicon detector. Um, here they've separated their two areas to search for their electronic recoils and nuclear recoils in the top and bottom parts of the plot. And you see remaining at the bottom, those three um, events that also are quite near threshold. And again, would correspond to a five to 10 GeV mass particle. The cogent experiment has a germanium crystal. They also looked and originally saw a bit of an annual modulation that went away with running longer. And they have an excess of events at the very lowest threshold the, that black versus red um, indicated they could have been seeing something. But in particle physics, seeing something close to your threshold is almost always expected um, and just shows that you don't have usually a handle on either your detector or your background, not so much that you're maybe seeing new physics. But this is what's been seen um, in the past in our field of direct dark matter detection. This summer, there was new excitement from the xenon one ton experiment in June, where not in their nuclear recoils, but in those electronic recoils, they saw a rise in events. And it could match. Um, so their gray is what they would have expected to see. Their black dots are their data. And they could fit different interesting physics models to see how well it matches. And so a particle called a solar axion um, or have or neutrinos that had an anomalous magnetic moment, or simply there being more tritium in their detector decaying, all could explain the signal that they saw. And this is really going to be um, the next generation of detectors biggest question to go after. Something they didn't initially discuss is the fact that there, besides tritium, there could be a radioactive argon 37 background. And um, and there's other signal models that show up as monoenergetic signals. So these are other um, axion-like particles or dark photons. So theorists went crazy. Hundreds of papers came out this summer uh, just about this data. But again, it's right at threshold um, and, and we can have a background. The level that we're talking about of tritium or argon-37 is 50 atoms in an over a ton of material. So this is something that, that there's, there's essentially no way to screen for, that these detectors are the most sensitive detectors you can build to look for any particle interaction. And we can't rule out even that there's, there's really trace amounts um, of contamination. So what I work on are these liquid xenon time projection chambers or a TPC. And in schematic, our detectors look like this picture here. So um, in my first picture we saw these photomultiplier tube arrays. So we've got light sensors at the top and bottom. We've got a cylindrical design where we've got a reflective surface on the side to help get all the light up to the top and bottom. And a particle could come in, interact, and we get an initial scintillation signal. And so that light is seen really primarily in the bottom of the detector because of total internal reflection from the surface at the top. And we've put a large electric field um, over this volume and that drifts the electrons upwards. We then actually pop them out of the liquid into gas, and again, a high electric field, and they bump into other electrons and give off light exactly the way a neon light does. And that signal is our ionization signal. Um, and when we name these different signals, they get the very uncreative S1 and S2 signals. We localize the detector 
in the xy plane by where that ionization signal is in the top part of our array. But the time between that signal and the earlier one tells us how deep in the detector it happens. And that's that time projection part of the name TPC. And in fact, it's the kind of relative ratios between how much light we see versus how much charge we see that can tell us whether we had a nuclear recoil or an electronic recoil. And you can imagine that if you know if you interact with an electron first, you're going to free many more electrons, you're going to have a bigger ionization signal, so a bigger S2. But when you hit the nucleus, you actually end up in an excited nuclear state, and that gives off more uh, scintillation light as it relaxes. So that's exemplified um, here in this plot, where I first show an electronic recoil coming in. So we've got an energy deposition coming in. Our heat isn't observed. We have some um, a larger area air, uh, arrow going to um, ionizing our xenon freeing some electrons and eventually giving us our S2 signal. And the smaller arrow coming into this excited, um, actually an excited dimer state. So if you, if you only had um, chemistry that taught you that the noble gases don't make um, molecules, this is the key where if you, when you have an excited state, you can make a molecule, but it then relaxes. And that's what gives us our scintillation light. And I can toggle this if you look at the relative sizes of all of these arrows between these electronic recoils and the nuclear recoils, you can see we lose a lot more um, energy to heat for the nuclear recoils. So we see a lot less of the energy, but that the relative size of these arrows to our ionization signal and our scintillation signal um, are very different. And that lets us tell the difference between a nuclear recoil and electronic recoil. So our detector is under construction right now. It's not been a great time to be building a detector um, during the COVID time, but this is what LZ looks like. We've got a seven ton liquid xenon um, TPC with about 10 tons total of xenon that gets circulated around and purified. It's sitting inside a large Vito um, detector with gadolinium loaded liquid scintillator. This lets us tag neutrons because neutrons can bump into our nucleus and give us a nuclear recoil that could trick us, although they interact far more often than dark matter does. A water shield to shield us from um, the gamma rays coming from the rock um, in our mine, and, and lots of external parts to bring our signals out, bring our xenon in and out, um, and put calibration sources in. It's located in um, the Sanford Underground Research Facility. So it's a retired gold mine, their home stake gold mine in the state of South Dakota, um, quite near. Um, where Mount Rushmore is right now, and also not a great place for COVID in the past year. Um, famously, in the 1960s, Ray Davis, a, a physical chemist, started a experimental program there that saw um, solar neutrinos and saw a deficit of them. And that's really one of the first hints that neutrinos oscillated. And it got the Nobel Prize in the exact um, hall where we run our experiment now. We have to handle all the xenon. We have to actually take out gas that's coming out of the plastic parts of our detectors. We build lots of parts of our experiments. We spend a lot of our time predicting all the backgrounds to our detectors. And we've got it down quite precisely um, where we expect six and a half events, where almost six of them come from leaking in electronic recoils because so many more of our backgrounds are those electronic recoils. And um, only about half of an event is expected from nuclear recoils, basically it's neutrons. The biggest source of these come from xenon contaminants, mostly from radon um, and some krypton. So we plot these out, we look at our, our recoil energies, we can see all these lines, and but we're really only going to be studying our experiments at these lowest energies. So we um, you know, we study in nuclear recoil energy um, up to about 30 keV um, in, in these plots. So that's, that's far on the left. It's really in just the first bin on the left plot, the first uh, third of the, the plot on the right. We have to plot a lot of these. And here is all the locations in our detector. And um, by using a veto, we go from the left to the right. So that's an important part of our detector. What would a signal look like 
again, this idea of energy on the x-axis and some idea of separating our particles on the y-axis, black are all of the background events. Uh, yeah, orange and yellow is where a signal for dark matter would be. And neutrinos from the sun would be down in this little purple bit at the bottom. In this field, we, um, we show these plots that are basically like a Nike swoosh plot of where we exclude everything above these lines. So our WIMP mass is along the x-axis and how strongly it interacts with matter is along the y-axis. And past experiments have ruled out um, everything above these lines. So the xenon one ton experiment has the best limit so far where we project our limit of the LZ experiment is this black line. Some interesting theory models are in this gray zone. And what's very important is that neutrinos from the sun and then from um, cosmic ray interactions in our atmosphere at higher energies will start giving us nuclear recoils um, in this red and orange zone. So it'll make it much harder to look for a dark matter signal when we're probing that sensitively. Let me skip this little, I'll just show you some quick pictures because they're quite pretty of our detector. These are those photomultiplier to arrays that that's go at the top and the bottom of our detector. This is the whole time projection chamber assembled. Here are the cryostats that they uh, go into because they have to be um, so liquid xenon temperatures at about 161 Kelvin, so warmer than liquid nitrogen, um, but still quite cold. Here it is the tanks going into our water veto chamber. And so LZ is going to turn on in 2021. What else is coming this year? Well, our close competitor and same technology experiment, Xenon N-Ton, is running in Italy. It's a collaboration between Europe, the US, and Japan. It's another liquid xenon TPC with a four-ton fiducial volume. It's probably going to be the first next generation experiment on, and we've got similar sensitivity to LZ. Another experiment that has um, UK uh, membership through the University of Birmingham is the News G experiment that's running in a mine in Canada where it actually uses a gas target that and sees the ionization signals as it's got one single uh, central anode. One of the other biggest programs for dark matter searches um, in the UK comes through the liquid argon um, program where their next detector is the dark side 20K. It's a 50 ton detector that would be underground at Gran Sasso. Um, it's got broad UK um, collaboration um, involvement. And you can see its sensitivity is again at, at high masses, very similar to the xenon experiments, but they need a much bigger detector because of argon being much lighter than a xenon uh, nucleus. So your chance of seeing um, your dark matter, you know, you need more of that target mass. And so they, they have to be um, larger. There's one group at Durham that works on the super CDMS cryogenic uh, crystal detector that would be at Snow Lab. And there's a new collaboration, and this is really some of the excitement in the dark matter field right now, kind of taking a theme from the last talk about using new techniques um, in quantum sensing and um, using helium-3 as your detector. So now you've got a very light nucleus, and so you can probe down to very light masses of dark matter, um, and you require quantum sensors to be able to see um, the energy that getting deposited, but, you know, the all those other plots I have shown of our sensitivities are, are off to the right of this plot um, and the helium detectors could get down to a much lower um, possible dark matter mass. The xenon detectors have been around a while. We had that early plot that showed how long they'd stayed, but really as they get larger, they stop being just a dark matter detector, which is great because we haven't seen dark matter yet. And if you want to actually measure something, have something to write a PhD thesis about, um, you need to do some other science. So there's not only WIMP dark matter to look at, but more complicated models of dark matter that we can look at from that original plot um, with the bees and the space cows. But we can also see neutrinos from the sun. We can see neutrinos from supernova. We can study neutrinos double beta decay and double electron capture, understanding the fundamental fundamental nature of, of other particles and study these atmospheric neutrinos and cosmic rays, um, other particles that we don't fully understand where they get all of their energy from. So we're excited um, about a detector. You know, We have to even plan for the detectors after the one we're trying to turn on right now. We can do lots of science, a wide array. 
But besides WIMP dark matter, there's also lots of excitement for um, other dark matter candidates, particularly axions and dark photons. So these are in the dark sector. They're very much lighter mass particles that we stop even calling a particle and start really calling them a wave. And there's lots of different um, ways to look for them. We've got an option where, so an axion is a boson that was introduced theoretically to help solve the strong CP violation problem. And maybe we'll just talk about that in the question and answer time. Um, and it hasn't been detected yet. Everyone's quite happy thinking that it does exist to solve the strong CP violation problem. And for certain masses, this particle could also be um, your dark matter candidate, which is great because um, it's like Occam's razor. We don't we only need one solution to two problems. And indeed, if you create many more new models um, of what our universe could be and what particles you need, different types of axions pop up all the time. And so it's a, it's a really common solution to particle problems. And so then it could, would make a great um, dark matter candidate. And there are three new projects um, using quantum technologies that are broad UK collaborations. They're also linked with larger global projects on this. So there's um, Aon, the, the Atom Interferometer Observatory and Network, um, QSHS, the Quantum Sensors for the Hidden Sector, and QI, the Quantum Enhanced Interferometry Experiment, all of them looking for various options um, of these other dark matter candidates, all using quantum sensors, which are really required down to these energies and to the precision desired. So let me end here. I know I've gone a little bit long. Um, so LZ is going to turn on in this year and run through 2025. And it's going to be the most sensitive dark matter detector to date. Also turning on this year should be the Xenon n ton and Mu G collaboration experiments. Following close on their heels in the next few years will be Super CDMS Snow Lab, Dark Side 20K, some smaller experiments, Axion experiments, all coming soon. So there's going to be a lot more data informing some of these dark matter models. But what's going to happen in our field after 25, 2025? Well, let's get down to that neutrino floor. Let's not leave any space unexplored where a lot of the, those models really sh show there's a strong chance of a, a WIMP um, particle being there. And with a bitter, bigger detector, we're not just studying dark matter, we're also studying neutrino physics. Um, so all of that's quite exciting and what we can do with these dark matter detectors. But of course, it's just attacking one part of the puzzle of dark matter and neutrino physics. We still need those indirect detection, those collider experiments um, and further neutrino studies to answer all of these questions um, about, about our universe. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for speaking with us, Dr. Palladino. Um, so I know several people have already been writing questions in the chat, so I'll read those out. Um, if anyone else has any questions, um, feel free to type them there as well. Um, or if you message one of us directly, um, or put your hand up, we should be able to get to you. Um, so I'll start with the questions that people were asking earlier. Um, or the earliest one. Um, so how weak is the interaction of dark matter with standard matter particles? Is it, um, is it different for, a, is it a different kind of force, different from the four basic forces? It could be, um, it's, it's not clear. So if in these Higgs mediated ones, um, it's, it's still kind of standard model, um, but some options are, are not um, standard model. So we really are just, um, um, so we just talk about um, these strengths of, of interactions here and um, I'm gonna mess it up embarrassingly. You know, I think we're, we're talking about, you know, 10 to the 28 to 32. So off the top of the scale is how strong a weak interaction would have been. So, so we've, we've gotten considerably weaker. And, and these, you know, we in fact don't even use cross-section couplings in the same way um, when we start talking about couplings um, to, um, to axions. Um, the next question is, can axion be a dark matter candidate, which I think you covered. 
Um, and another one, can sterile neutrinos be also a candidate for dark matter? Yeah, a sterile neutrino can be a dark matter candidate, and some members of the neutrino community really like that idea. The, the, <laughs> there seem to be people who, if you strongly believe in sterile neutrinos, it's a great dark matter candidate. Um, if you don't believe in sterile neutrinos, then why would it be a, a dark matter candidate? It's, it's kind of, um, again, it's, it's a particle that can exist to help us explain why neutrinos have the very low mass that they have through something that called the seesaw mechanism, where where by having a really big, heavy neutrino, you can have some very light neutrinos. Um, but um, but the, the evidence for this, the current evidence for the type of sterile neutrinos people look for do not make great um, dark matter candidates. There are other ones that have, have had coming and going evidence that would be a better dark matter candidate, um, but, but they've usually been discounted. Um, but maybe, you know, it, yeah, it's, it's an option. <laughs> Great, I think the next question from Sam is, current models of Milgramian dynamics cannot fully explain, amongst other things, the anisotropy of the CMB. On the other hand, most dark matter theories cannot account for observed breakings of the strong equivalence principle, external field effects, as Mond TEBES, um, accurately predicts it. Do you think that the search for a candidate of dark matter is broad enough that there will eventually be one that fits all the data as required? Or do you believe that it is more promising to try to combine such approaches, Mond and Wimp, for instance, to fit all of the current observations? I think I'm probably a little more, um, a little more skeptical of, of most Mond. Again, this is that's not my area of specialty, but do I think I think, you know, I think many of us in the dark matter community think the chance of there being exactly one new particle that we have never seen before that explains everything that's going on in the universe is really unlikely, right? We've seen it's, it's five times more stuff than everything else we've measured and everything else we've measured isn't one particle. So, so why would there only be one more? So do I think that there's probably a wide wealth of things going on? Yes. Um, I think also fitting into all of these gravitational stories is what is going on with dark energy. And, can, and there are people who are trying to create models where, where you're solving dark, dark energy um, and the, the acceleration of the expansion of the universe along with dark matter at the same time. And, and those are kind of some of the interesting models that, that get tied down. I mean, one of the real difficulties is that people who work in these fields are working at the intersections of many different fields and we don't all understand each other's evidence each other's types of detectors or even you know the mathematics that goes into solving our different problems and so when you've got a good model in one area truly evaluating whether some other evidence already eliminates it is actually and um and it's something that we need to resolve over time and, and no great answer has you know gotten enough enthusiasm from people in the other communities to help them evaluate it there also. So, so there's, there's clearly more things going on. I don't know if it's Mond, but do I think that there's a really complicated world out there that gives us lots to explore? Yes. <laughs> Great, the next question is, if nothing interacts with dark matter and dark energy, how can we, uh, can we really confirm that it has mass? Apart from them being the only unaccounted for mass when measuring the mass of the universe, how do we know for sure that they interact with the Higgs field? Oh yeah, they might not interact with the Higgs field. Um, you know, I think the depressing option for, for all physicists would be a particle that just has mass and nothing else and just interacts with gravity. And we have to wait to understand all of quantum gravity to, to help us predict anything else extra. And we're just potentially stuck there. So, you know, I do um, an example <laughs> of what it's like looking for dark matter for, for kids where we've got uh, different boxes with things inside, but you can't see them. You have to reach your hand in and feel and try and tell what it is. And so, you know, we say, oh, you have to use other senses. You know, you can't see it. So you're waiting to, to see something else. And so in, in one box, I've got, um, I've got the thing I say, physicists would love for it to be dark matter and it's coffee beans. And to figure out it's coffee beans, you really have to take your hand out and smell it and you realize it's coffee. But of course, in another box, I have nothing. And I say, this is all of, our, this is what, you know, we're all worried is out there for us to find. And it's, it's just empty. So, um, 
So there, there are um, many options, usually not to explore too widely by theorists because it, they don't give many new exciting predictions because they don't give you anything else to see. But there are always options where we're just stuck with what we're at. And that you know, hasn't, hasn't been what it's been like in any other part of physics yet. So it, it feels silly to say this would be the end of the line. Um, but but easily, um, certainly things can evade um, our current technology and our ideas for you know the next 50 years of searching also. Sounds good. Um, I think the next two questions are the questions by people who have already asked. So I'm going to skip to a more recent one and then we'll come back to your questions if um, there's still time. Um, I have heard some physicists are using gravitational waves to detect dark matter, especially axions. Do you think that this is a uh, promising way of studying dark matter? Yes. Yeah, so, yes. I mean, the idea that we can now do multi messenger astronomy, that we not only see light over numerous wavelengths, we see charged particles as cosmic rays, we see neutrinos and gravitational waves, they're traveling huge cosmological distances and have time to interact with different things. You know, our, our ability, you know, we should exploit this um, to our best ability and, and really, you know, theorists helping get, give ideas to the people who study that of what other signals um, that might not have to do with the main physics they were originally trying to study with that data, I, I think are, are is super interesting and important and, and has often in the past been how new physics is discovered. Thank you. Um, so I'll go back to one of the earlier questions now. Um, somebody's asked, can a spin three halves particle be a dark matter? Um, I think so, although I haven't paid that much um, attention to different possible spins of particles. I must say they're not, they're not in the main models I have studied or paid attention to. But for instance, um, one of the things that I really like is using um, a really broad effective field theory model of how particles can interact to interpret our data. And this is a little different. It, it's, it's, it's kind of a flip of, of how, you know, people in the Clyder world sometimes talk about effective field theories. This is the, all of the different maths you could write down for how any particle could interact with any, anything, including forces that don't exist now, you know, how, how all the different just possible maths of how things can interact and checking all of those. And so a number of those have, can have some very interesting spin effects as well as some momentum transfer effects that no known physics does yet. And so, you know, that's where a, seeing a, a particle with a different spin show up um, could be quite interesting. So I don't know the, the direct answer to that. I imagine if you name it, somebody can come up with something, <laughs> but, uh, but I could be wrong. <laughs> or there's some theorist who's like, oh no, that's microwave background and you know, oh well. I didn't know. <laughs> um, another question, a little existential, but with your extensive knowledge on dark matter, do you believe the universe will end due to gravity defeating dark energy and pulling everything together into another singularity or dark energy defeating gravity and pushing every atom away um, from every other to the point where interactions cannot happen anymore? Oh, well, I mean, the crazy option is that um, between those two is what our universe currently seems to be exactly at. So it, you know, it's the version where dark energy doesn't win, but dark matter doesn't win. And we just keep expanding at some constant rate because we, we've reached that rate of expansion. So, you know, that's the most mathematically unlikely option because it requires perfect balancing of everything, but that's what our universe looks like right now. And this is the fine tuning problem that's related to, you know, all of our other problems with our models is just how too perfectly they all seem right now. So I'll choose that <laughs> way too perfect an option <laughs> right now. Thank you. Um, I don't think there are any other questions in the chat, so I'll ask one of my own that I love asking all of our speakers. Um, this topic of dark matter, I think, is definitely something that pop science articles 
taken all sorts of different directions. Do you have any resources for those of us who are really interested in the talk um, about where we might be able to learn more, um, wh whether it's more technical or, or less technical, um, but, but that might expose us to a few more ideas than you were able to cover in your short talk? Yeah, you know, actually, that's a great question. And I haven't been compiling like I will say that I've been very impressed with um, articles that have shown up in Wired and in uh, Quanta. Um, and, and they've got, you know, some really great, I think, science reporters who've been covering dark matter and, and not only um, covering, uh, oops, go back, not only covering dark matter, but covering uh, the scientists and the excitement of, of doing what we do and kind of the crazy environments we do them in um, really have come alive in, in, I think, those two publications more so than you know, really reading like a journal article in Science or Nature or or more of a, a standard newspaper science article either. I think um, I think that's where I would suggest starting. Somebody else has asked, could you talk about the CP violation problem you mentioned? You wanted to just what you wanted to discuss further? Oh sure. So just is just to know that um, see there there's there's otherwise nothing to say that you can't have CP violations. So this is charge and parity. So it would be if you swap a particle with its antiparticle and you swap left for right, um, things look the same, but they shouldn't necessarily have to. And one way to make them um, the same is by the Petchy Quinn method of inventing a new particle, and this is the axion. And so, you know, this was from the 1960s. All that's ever happened is this has been written down mathematically, and um, and it and yet the whole community agrees. Yep, that's how to solve it. It's the most elegant way. Sounds great. Um, and then that makes makes um, an axion. Now, when you <laughs> the complicated part of the story is you really want certain axions to call to solve this QCD problem, and you want certain massive axions to solve dark matter. And in fact, so there's there's one really nice, simple relationship where those two can both be solved with the same particle, but there's a much wider variety where we can have two different axions, one that's dark matter and one that solves CP violation. So it's all, <laughs> um, it's a bit unusual, yeah. Thanks. Somebody else has asked, are we also looking for dark matter candidates in terms of composite objects as opposed to fundamental particles? Yeah, so the most simple way to think about looking for it compositively is looking for an inelastic scatter where, um, you know, not all of your energy goes into a recoil because, and so we've got two different types of inelastic scattering. We can inelastically scatter our standard particle or we can inelastically, you know, the dark matter can inelastically scatter. And that could be a scatter that always happens with like a very particular energy because it's like the, you know, it would be the idea of a, a relaxation in some property of that particle uh, or, or the, that composite system. Um, so there are other um, more complicated composite methods where, for instance, you could see correlated signals in your nuclear recoil and your electronic recoil band. You could have, you know, you could have funny interactions happening with regular matter if when you've got a more complicated system. So um, there's there's a lot of different ways to interpret the data. I think it's it's our job to try and take some of you know the most sensitive to the lowest energies and you know with the least background data so that for as you know as many phenomenologists and theories come up with models in the future for us to study that we'll have a data set that we can try and apply that to. Thanks. So it's 7.30. So um, I think there's one question in the chat right now, which I'll ask. And then if anyone else has any more questions, um, Dr. Palladino has kindly joined our Slack um, workspace. Um, so there is going to be, if you look in announcements, there's a link to the channel questions for Dr. Palladino, um, where you'll be able to ask any more questions. Um, so the one remaining question is, how incomplete do you believe the standard model is? The amount of free parameters that need to be manually fixed is over 20. Um, is, just a minute, um, is this a sign of incompleteness? Oh, that's, so it's tough as, um, as really like a, 
so in our field of direct dark matter searches, you know, there's a much smaller collaboration and, and more of us really, really feel um, like we're hardware people. And one of those things as a hardware people is that there are sometimes just rules and they, they, <laughs> they don't have to make sense and you're okay living with them. And so in many ways, I think I'm probably less bothered by, by X number of parameters you have to set because eh, that's just the way it is. Um, it's certainly not elegant. It doesn't feel like a whole theory, um, but, but how many is too many? You know, if, if we only had to set four, would that feel complete? Um, if there has to be setting a hundred, maybe, you know, that's, it's, it's a hundred. Um, you know, maybe the universe works in base 25 and there is 25, you know, it's, it's very, <laughs> it's, um, it's a hard question for me. It's not something that, that universally bothers me or that I would bring up as evidence for, for why things are incomplete, but it certainly does feel incomplete. It does feel like, you know, we, we don't, we don't understand dark energy, dark matter. We don't know if we've got any Majorana particles. This would be when neutrinos are their own antiparticles. But this is one of the things, right? In most of our most of our dark matter models, dark matter is its own antiparticle. Um, you know, seeing if that is happening, we don't fully understand um, a lot of our 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 CP violations. Um, and so there's you know, and so there's, you know, there's for instance, a lot of interest in trying to measure it in um, in the neutrino sector coming up. So there's certainly problems to go after, and I do hope for there being simple, um, elegant solutions. But that simple, elegant solution, in some ways, might actually also still be more complicated, if that makes any sense. And I, I need to come up with a good, um, you know, analogy for this, but. But having some answer that explains everything, even if it's kind of a mess, might just be what happens. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Dr. Palladino, for speaking to us today. Um, thank you for all of the attendees who've come. Um, this has made it a really great day of our, the first day of our um, conference for this year. Um, so there will be another four speakers tomorrow. Um, starting at 1 p.m. And I believe you can find the Zoom link um, probably wherever you found the Zoom link to this one. Um, so we're looking forward to seeing more of you all tomorrow. Um, we hope you've enjoyed the first day. Um, Ilgisu, Sharish, would you like to add anything? Uh, we hope you enjoyed today's uh, talks. Um, I certainly thought both of them were very fascinating, um, you know, to be discussing certain things really on the forefront of physics and um, hope to see you all tomorrow. Again, the link to the Slack work workspace if you haven't joined yet is um, in the Zoom chat and speakers will be there to answer questions um, as well as you being able to speak to um, other attendees um, to find other people who share your interest in this exciting physics.